Uh, hello, and welcome to this session on storytelling and meaning making. Speakers have elected to introduce themselves. Our first speaker is Dr. Mary Hess, Professor of Educational Leadership at Luther Seminary, who will lead us in a discussion and Q&A on the subject of caring for creation through the power of digital storytelling, after which Nick Fagnett, PhD student at Boston College, of Theology and Tamise Spencer Helms, PhD student at the United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities, will co-facilitate a presentation also with Q&A on the topic of Hope Blossoms, the, I believe it's live, L-I-B-E, method of storytelling and meaning making in climate action. Uh, Mary? Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to speak as uh, as short as possible um, so that I can get to an exercise for you guys to try. Um, but I'm putting my slides in uh, the chat um, so that you can see them as you choose if you want to click on links. Um, but I am going to share my screen um, right now to um, myself on track here. Um, so. Uh, first thing to note is that I come to you from Luther Seminary, uh, which is on Minnesota Makoche, the homelands of the Dakota Oyate. Uh, the Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Cheyenne, Oto, Iowa, and the Sac and Fox also inhabit Minnesota land. We recognize that God calls all to be right in, re in right relationship with our neighbors, that the tribes are sovereign nations, that there's a history of broken treaties and broken trust, and that there's much reconciling work to be done as Christians. We also recognize that in Christ, there is new life, forgiveness, and hope for mending what is broken. And we pray the Holy Spirit will lead us in this work. Um, can I make sure that you guys are seeing my slides? Can I get a thumbs up? Okay, good. So what I want to do here is actually, uh, I loved Randy Woodley's um, notion of dis disequilibrium or disequilibrate. Um, uh, so this is a collaborative session, which is mostly going to be given over to an exercise. And I want to commend the papers that have already been offered during the session. I'm really, or during this week, I'm really excited. Um, and there's lots of bibliography and citations and all sorts of stuff there that you can go for um, to find. But this is, this is a, a research project that's still in process, right? So um, it's not... Uh, Oh, I can't move this. Shoot, I'm going to just stop this for a second and move this up here. Um, this is a research project that's currently ongoing. So I'm inviting you to experience a glimpse of it rather than trying to give you um, definitive uh, conclusions. I want to note that this research is rooted in indigenous epistemologies, particularly circle practices and storing faith. Um, and I need to be very clear about the fact that my standpoint is one who's only learning these practices. And my standpoint has been hugely narrowly formed, right, um, through hegemonic cultural practices. So I come with deep gratitude and respect for what I'm learning from the work of scholars on intersectional pedagogies in particular. I also come, uh, this research is rooted in a recognition of the dynamics um, of authority, authenticity, and agency that are shifting so dramatically amidst digitality, and I've written about that. Um, I'm coming um, with a recognition that we live in a time of deep context collapse, also something I've written about. Uh, and finally, uh, that learning in this era needs to be about igniting curiosity, curating appropriate materials, and sharing good practices. So I bring to this project three decades of work on media education and digital storytelling. If you've downloaded the slides, you can get a link there to my stuff. I'm particularly concerned about the very strong and deep polarization that I believe we are inhabiting in the United States. So I've been very interested in what might uh, let us move through some of that in more constructive ways. Um, I have a definition of faith formation that finds the create share belief pedagogical circle particularly compelling also something I've written about. And finally, I come with a deep humility. This project is a very tiny intervention <laughs> located in primarily white congregations that are geographically rooted in the upper Midwest of the US. So that's really important to understand. Um, Brian Stevenson, whose work you may know from the book, Just Mercy or a lot of other things, um, his four practices led to the questions that shaped this research for me. He talks about getting prop 
proximate. And I was curious, can I invite people into stories about caring for creation that are personal? He invites us to change the narratives. So I'm curious about whether such stories when shared might start to change a narrative of polarization. He invites us to find our hope. And I'm curious about what kind of hope might arise in a process like this. And I love the papers we've been hearing from this whole week that have talked a lot about resilience and hope in resistance. And then finally, um, he talks about embracing discomfort. And I'm curious about whether we can find ways to embrace grief and anger um, that arises around climate catastrophe together. Um, so what is this project? Well, my hypothesis has been that digital storytelling is a modality that has potential amidst climate catastrophe. Um, I've held 11 workshops so far involving more than 100 people across five states, Minnesota, South Dakota, Montana, Wisconsin, and Ohio. There is a very key quotation that has sustained this project, and I am so energized by the way in which this quote has resonance with all stuff that's been voiced this week. And it is a quote that forms the beginning introduction of every one of my official research workshops, which of course exist under IRB approval and consent forms and et cetera, et cetera. And this is the quote, it comes from Valerie Kaur. She says, joy is the gift of love. Grief is the price of love. Anger protects that which is loved. And when we think we've reached our limit, wonder is the act that returns us to love. So how might we get in touch with wonder? The workshops I've been holding work this way. There we do introductions. We work through a covenant of presence. We do two story circles. We have a shared meal. We do a co-laboratory around audio using voice memo apps on the devices that people themselves bring. This is a bring your own device project. Uh, and then we do a co-laboratory around digital video using iMovie, Canva, or ClipChamp, depending on the devices that people have brought. Um, when possible, we do a shared presentation of the videos people have created. I can say more about that later. And then we do a closing blessing. So it's a day long workshop that's been held in, as I said, 11 different spaces. You can find stories that have been published so far at this link on the project website. I will note that one of the interesting things for me has been the extent to which people wanna keep working on their stories. And so sometimes it's really hard for me to get them to say they're done <laughs> so that they're kind of rolling out from there. I want to do one story circle with you all today. The bulk of what I want to do with you is a story circle um, because I want to give you a taste of how it's not even so much the stories you tell as it is the practices we invite people into to listen. Like actually the other thing I tend to say at the beginning of one of these workshops is that we become who we are by the stories we tell and the listeners who hear them. So for me, this project is very much also about listening. So here's the way this works. Um, there is actually a handout that if you clicked on the session when you came, it's embedded in that, but it's also on the slides. And this is what I'm gonna invite you to do. I'm gonna invite you to move into breakouts, which Mark is happily setting up for us in groups of four people. I want you to remember that everybody has a story to tell and no one's story needs to be fixed. This is an operation. To, this is an opportunity to share and listen carefully. I'm going to assume that you're all educators who know what a covenant of presence is. So I'm not going to invite you to do that first. That would take a whole nother hour. Um, but the basic uh, process is that I'm going to ask with four people, one person's going to tell a story. One person is going to listen for the facts of the story. One person is going to listen for the feelings in the story, and one person is going to listen for the values in the story. So the storyteller will tell a story no more than three minutes, and this is where having a phone with a digital timer will be very useful. I'm hoping each of you might have that, or somebody in your group of four will have that. I actually have taken to using egg timers when I do this in person, because you don't then have to fuss with the phone. Um, but anyway... Uh, one person tells the story, the other three listen for the ways that they've been invited to listen. And then when the person is done with the story, the three people say what they've heard back to the person who told the story, take a pause, and then you switch roles, right? So you're going to have to keep track before each person 
tells their story what the other three people are doing and everybody should have an opportunity to tell a story you can pass if you want to um, and every person should have an opportunity to inhabit each of those roles am i making sense um i cannot see very well here but i'm hoping that you guys can figure this out like i said you'll need a timekeeper and then here's the story prompt which i will also put in the chat this is a story prompt that's been used throughout this project, and I can say more later about how that came about. But share a story of how your faith connects you to the natural world, and in particular, how it spurs your care for creation. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. I'm going to say that again, and then Mark is going to put us into breakout. So just a minute of silence. Take some notes on yourself. What might be a story? A moment, a memory, a brief glimpse, right? We're talking less than three minutes. How does your faith connect you to the natural world and in particular spur your care for creation? What else? What else did you notice? Or questions do you have in the remaining eight minutes perhaps? before we switch, before we take a break and then switch. You can just unmute and, and chime in if you like. Well, I will share that a couple of us were not nature people. So it made the assignment somewhat difficult because mm -hmm. we don't like outdoors. Mm -hmm. We are indoor plumbing and electricity people. But for those of us who could appreciate outside, um, there was uh, gratitude and reconciliation. Um, there was some beauty found in gardening and we did recycle, even us indoor folks. And a connection also to the ancestors, in particular through things like the Hush Harbors, where there was a, uh, an, a, I guess, an appreciation and an all. I guess the word would be all mm -hmm. of how they were able to find liberation and truth in that experience from what they were going through outside and, I guess, mm -hmm. right, uh, during the day. Mm -hmm. um, so just a, a, a gratitude for setting the pace as it were or giving us something to to look for in each gen each subsequent generation mm -hmm. and it serves as a silent witness mm. to our fate yeah i was struck by how much i appreciated uh learning from my fellow listeners uh, in in their uh, hearing the story and and analyzing it in the into the facts feelings and uh, values so uh, the the listening experience to the others uh, as well as to the story was important thank you in mm. our in our threesome there were two jennifers and me uh, I could have, we could have tried to all be more alike by being three Jennifers, but that wasn't the point. Actually, uh, we didn't ask each other ages, but I could perceive we're of three different generations. And uh, or, uh, I'll just say the three of us were of different ages and different places. And we didn't try to connect our stories, but we could listen across generation and across <laughs> the miles and we can, and how rich that becomes. Thank you, Lucinda. I think you were trying to get in there a minute ago. Yeah, I had a question. Um, I had a hard time um, landing on a uh, story. And so my question is for Barbara about if you're still there. Yeah, um, for people who didn't, aren't, outdoor people did you have a hard time thinking of a story and what was what might be helpful for people that 
uh, just can't quite get into it. And you need to do that pretty rapidly. So Mary, also, you might speak to that in your experience. Well, I mean, I had a story. My father used to take us fishing. I just hated it. <laughs> well, it's a fine, but that's a fine story to tell a story about something you dislike too. Right. I just don't. And, and he was raised on a farm and I remember going to the farm. I don't like outdoors. <laughs> and Dr. Paulette, she's the gardener among us. So we had stories. We just, that's not who we are. <laughs> Right. Well, I, was, I would say in my case, a neophyte gardener, I, I, as I was sharing with my group, I have done some things out in the yard just out of necessity because I don't want the neighbors to think we have the worst looking yard. So I will do some things, you know, outside, but I'm really like Barbara, I don't really care for the outside. I want to make one comment about that and then we're going to take a stretch break or or whatever before so we make our transition here i want to note um first of all that stories of pain or frustration or irritation can be equally powerful stories to tell um and i and i think they're important right like that's the whole the valerie core quote again about joy grief anger and wonder um each of those emotions right but the other thing is that um in in my research each workshop i do i work with the host of the congregation or the organization ahead of time to try to come up with a prompt and language that's appropriate to that space, which of course in this context, cause y'all are coming from a whole bunch of different spaces. I chose just one of the more generic prompts we've used. The web, my research website has a bunch of the prompts that we've used across different spaces. Um, and that of course adds complexity to what kind of conclusions I draw from this, right? In terms of whether the stories are similar or not based on what the prompts were, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think um, it's really important when you're doing story circle work to construct spaces that allow or invite people to share what is authentic for them, right? So I really appreciate Barbara you speaking up in that way about the, that particular one because it it's, it's really true. Um, I'm not following the chat very well here. Um, maybe one more comment or question, and then we're going to take a stretch break so that we can transition to the next um, part of this collaborative session. Any last. Nobody wants to do the last word. <laughs> Let me just note that you can find on that the stuff I put into the slides or the stuff that is linked via the session or earth.storyingfaith.org, which is the my main website, um, any of a bunch of stuff. And I'm happy to talk to anybody. And if anybody wants to host this kind of workshop somewhere where you are, um, I'd be happy to find a way if I can figure out how to get there <laughs> um, uh, to do it. So um, anyway, thank you. Mary, sure. are you doing any of it digitally? You mentioned earlier today that, you know, we're trying not to travel as much. I, right. I'm just wondering if, you're, if you have a version of it that can be done. I have done one that's hybrid. The challenge, so in both in person and online, the challenge has been the second half, which we didn't do here. I think this first half we did could easily work in online spaces, but the sitting by people and helping them learn how to use their own devices to do the audio recording and the digital video editing, I haven't figured out how to do that online yet. So um, I don't know about that piece of it. I, I'm, I'm experimenting with a couple of people to try to figure out how to do that. Um, in one case, we had some high school students who are willing to show up with people locally to help them, to sit by them, maybe to help. Um, and then the folks that had signed up to come got COVID and couldn't come. And so the whole thing didn't happen. So which is the other thing about this. Um, I can't tell you how many workshops have been set up and then didn't happen because of varieties of things. So um, anyway, thank you so much for your willingness to participate in a national story circle. And now I think we need to take a five minute stretch break. Um, so move around, hydrate, do what you need to do so that you're fresh when you come back for Nick and Tamis. Okay. 
So we're pausing the camera for everyone to take like a bathroom break, right? And... Okay. All yours. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, but Nick right. is still on mute. Yep. Is that what you intended? Okay. All right. Um, all right, friends. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to um, share my screen, uh, kind of bounce back and forth between sharing the screen uh, with the slideshow and then be, us being able to see our faces. Tamise will be sharing her screen and some sound for a little bit as well. Uh, so we'll be bouncing back and forth there. Um, let's get going. All right, um, our session is called Hope Blossoms, the Live Method of Storytelling and Meaning Making in Climate Action. Um, I'm Nick Fagnant. I'm a doctoral student at the Cloud School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College. Uh, my degree, degree program is Theology and Education, and I'm working in uh, queering Jesuit high schools. How can we, what's the, ju the justice transformational work that queer and trans kids need to happen in, in, in some of our Catholic high schools? And to me, and I'm Tamise Spencer Helms. Pronouns are they and she. I have a master's in theology and a master's in leadership. I'm currently getting my doctorate in social transformation, working on how we can create new epistemological frameworks uh, out of hip hop for a post digital and post Christian world, uh, particularly for creating um, hush harbor experiences for Black students. So happy to be with you all. What we'll be doing today um, is the live method um, from Dr. Dory Baker's uh, girlfriend theology. Uh, she first introduced this um, a while ago to the REA, so a lot of you are probably familiar with this. Um, recently, I, I met Dory on an REA call a few months ago, and she had talked about how she had updated her book um, and, and really added more um, voices and perspectives of queer and trans folk, non-binary folk, um, non-white folk, folk, like broadening uh, that idea. And so I read the text and um, she introduced me to Tamise and we're really excited to share this with you. Um, our hope is that, uh, that this method can inform leaders who hope to learn from and assist young people as they reinterpret uh, their religious traditions to support individual spiritual development and to strengthen communal climate activism. Today's collaborative session is going to be a demonstration of the method um, during which some folks will grapple with the spiritual implications of and explore resources for living with meaning during this time. Um, we have participants uh, who are on our call. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, from across religious traditions, we've spent um, a few months um, already doing this process several times together um, on Zoom calls where we've come together, we've built community, we've practiced the method, people have shared their stories, um, and it's been incredibly beautiful. Um, and I'm really excited to share that. So first, what we're going to do is is an example of this. I'll quickly walk through the method, um, and uh, Tamise will have a prayer for us, and then um, I will ask our participants to introduce themselves, and then we'll do a fishbowl where we just kind of let them go through the method. And at the very end, we're going to ask them to kind of reflect on what, are, what have been their learnings from this experience overall, and then for the rest of you, for all of the observers, um, what what do you notice? What are your what wisdom? What's the insight? What insights do you gain? Where do you think you could possibly implement this in your own in your own work in your own ministry? Um, so this is this is the method. Um, this is from Dory's website. Um, the four steps: L I V E. Listen, immerse, view, and explore slash enact. Um, and so Amber, who's in the call, is going to be sharing um, a story that she has already written, and in, 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 like we we worked with her on this. Um, She's worked with us. Uh, where kind of like the the idea is um, a story where she's kind of felt a, a connection to creation, a connection to the environment, like kind of what that means for her personally. And she'll share this story, and then we'll go through this. Our, our the participants will go through the method. Um, we breathe, we center, and and we listen. Um, we explore the feelings, explore our emotions, then immerse. Um, a little bit deeper into like what wh where is this story as, as the listener what what's being activated for me where in my like embodied how am I experiencing this story then view we kind of take a step back and say okay is there is there something that I noticed from the story or from someone sharing so far that has 
like that, that connects to my faith tradition in some way or to a different story or some something else in my life or something I saw on the news. H how does this connect in a broader way to, to larger stories and meaning makings that we have? Um, and the last step, to, to explore, to enact. Like what's this one, like from the whole experience, what's that one aha moment I wanna take away? What What is something that I do that I can actually put something into practice, put something in action? Uh, through this experience. Um, big, small, whatever. Again, the idea is how do we cultivate community and build relationship and build these, these discernment and de development skills uh, for that personal spiritual growth as well as that communal justice activism aspect. Like this very much integrates and supports both. Um, and so I'm going to ask now our participants um, to, to unmute maybe one at a time uh, and just kind of briefly say... Yeah, what do you want? Names, pronouns, where you are, and um, kind of like the, the the religious tradition that you come from, your faith tradition that you bring to this. So I I leave that to you. I'm happy to go first. Um, my name is Amber. Um, I am coming to you from the ancestral lands of the um, Shawnee, Miami, and Peoria people on the map today as Columbus, Ohio. Um, okay, my computer screen just completely. <laughs> um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and as far as faith tradition, um, I come from a Christian background, um, Pentecostal at first, but um, I would say non-denominational at this point and very much um, like a lot of people with 2020. Um, very much the type of faith that I like to ask questions um, to questions to um, just so I can suss out what is truth and what is um, perspective. My name is Robert Monson and my pronouns are he, him. I am originally from Chicago and I am currently getting a PhD uh, at the University of Denver. And my faith tradition, I grew up as a Black athe atheist, uh, capital B in Black. Um, yeah, but so I'm happy to be here with you all. Hello, my name is Alyssa Wilson, pronouns she, her, and I'm coming to you from Raleigh, North Carolina. And my faith background is Christian. I grew up with a Disciples of Christ mother. So I'm a, I'm a PK, uh, go PKs. And right now I have been exploring and attending a Unitarian Universalist fellowship. Um, and I think that is kind of what I most closely um, relate to at this point in my life. And we have a few other folks um, who have been a part of our community who are on a little bit earlier. Um, and uh, my hope is that they return. Uh, they've been like also great members of our community. Um, and so I'm going to um, invite Tamise to have our opening, um, our, our, our grounding moment. And then I will, one more time, take a quick look at what we're doing for the first part. And then Amber will take it from there. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. I'm so excited that we get to experience this together. And so I'm going to light a candle to commemorate the fact that this is sacred and that we are holding space for sacred story in the middle of a Thursday afternoon, which is incredible. And so I'm going to light this candle. I'm going to play a um, poem um, called Psalm in the Key of Diaspora. And then Amber will share um, her sacred story with us. This is Teresa Siangotonu reading Praise Poem in the Key of Diaspora. Praise the ocean for teaching me that home is not location as much as it is belonging where I am wanted. Praise the ocean for always wanting me, for washing my body in and naming it child. Praise the way the water bites at my ankles but never breaks the skin. Praise the skin on my ankle that had to break for the gun. 
for the tatao drawn by the gun's mouth in the hands of a tufunga during my first tatao appointment on island when I was 17 years old, praise his cigarette break so I could complete my sobbing in peace. Praise the umu, the underground oven of hot rocks and fire, cooking the sweet coconut milk in the center of salted leaves for palusami for the thick gallo and soft fattiness of octopus tentacles. Praise the crinkled crack of metal on the edge of every can of tuna, greasy from oil chunks of fish peppered over a bowl of hot rice. Praise the ground as dining room table, as only place to eat, at eating at the feet of our elders as the talking chief blessed us in prayer. Praise the mother mosquito and her obsession with the back of my legs. Praise the stench of repellent that stuck to my skin like booby trap like tourist trick, like second generation, like not quite from here. Praise the heavenly scorch of heat behind my ears. Praise the lowered heads and crossed legs atop each woven fala mat. Praise the village of women who wove them. The mulberry bark that was beaten enough to braid. Praise the broken flip-flops running alongside flattened frogs on the road headed towards the church house. Praise the choir of children who sing with one tongue. Praise the way we lay our dead to rest in front of each house. How there is no need for cemeteries if our kin never really die. Praise the way they return home to us. Praise home. Praise us. Whenever you're ready, Amber. Mom, and if Tamis, if you can unshare your screen, I can reshare mine. All right, friends. Um, so L for the live method. Listen to the story. We flit our candle. That beautiful prayer to breathe in center. You now Amber, Amber will share her story. Um, and we invite you all to listen as though you're listening to scripture, as if you expect the holy to show up. Listen deeply without an agenda, paying attention to the feelings the story stirs in you. Amber, please. All right. Can you hear me okay? Okay. All right. There's a story my family loves to tell about me as a toddler. It begins with my aunts relaying their perspectives and preparing for a family outing on a quiet Sunday morning. Life and time are flowing at their normal steady pace when all of a sudden, a blood curdling scream emanates from the parking lot. Everyone is familiar with my little lungs, so they come running. They find me standing there, distraught, tears running down my face. What's the matter? One aunt asks. I point to an area of my skirt. Through my stiff sniffles, I explain, I got dirty. Everyone waits expectantly as the storyteller reveals the next plot twist. The spot I pointed to was a small, almost unnoticeable stain in a sea of white cotton. The room then roar roars with a cacophony of laughter and accusations of me being a prissy princess. I always experience a strange sensation in my body when I hear this story. It's like a separation of sorts. The story is about me, but I do not identify with the little girl they describe. In my earliest memories, dirt and soil, soil were both teacher and playmate. I remember finding sticks to dig in the ground so that I could inspect the roots of the grass, kneeling for hours just to watch the ants crowd on the sidewalk to eat away at a piece of candy or ice cream that I'd accidentally dropped. I would spend autumn and some summer collecting leaves of different colors and scents and employing my grandma's help in pressing and preserving the most precious ones. As I got a little older, I swore I was some great alchemist who could turn weeds into perfume, body spray, soap, or whatever household item made sense to a seven-year-old grassroots scientist. It wasn't until a conversation with my mother, mother when I was a teenager that I began to understand the disconnect. After hearing the 1,246 retelling of about my stained skirt, I confided in her about the strange disconnect. That's probably my fault, she confessed. She went on to explain that my brother and I were two of the few children she knew who would make mud pies, then proceed to actually eat them. 
She was afraid we were too curious and comfortable with dirt and the outside world. She said she also grew tired of dressing us in nice clothes, only for me to lead everyone to go digging in the dirt in the name of adventure. So she sat me down and explained that the dirt was bad for me and that my clothes needed to stay clean. With the best of intentions, I was taught to see my former playmate as a stranger with the potential to do harm. The divide grew as I learned more about, my his about the history of my ancestors and the relationship with the la land. Stolen from home and forced to toil and exploit a land that would nourish their blood, sweat, and tears until it at last claimed their bodies and dreams as well. My adult mind could not fathom a reality where these two parties, forced in a relationship of mutual harm, could find camaraderie. However, my heart had experienced a taste of this unreality and still secretly longed for it. It was the desire to resolve this cognitive dissonance that led me to a faith-based study of a book called Watershed Discipleship. Together with cu other curious souls around the globe, I delved into the stories of people who found expression of their faith through healing their relationship with the land. I got to hear from others experiencing the same dichotomy of desire and disconnect. We discussed the pain and shame of feeling like a stranger in the only home we'd ever known. We gave space and voice to our ponderings as to whether a different reality was a possibility. During this time of ongoing discussion, a dear friend with indigenous roots offered a shift in paradigm. She spoke of the earth as an ancestor bearing witness to our ancestors. She imagined that the land and people bled, cried, sang, and hoped alongside each other. She said that perhaps when death came, the land welcomed my ancestors' bruised bodies not as a stranger, but as a friend. A friendship forged through a mutual resistance to bondage and hopelessness with a vision of hope and healing that future ge generations like mine would be free to realize. It was though I had finally found the seam I had been looking for. The edge of both stories that when held together were flush alongside each other, ready to be mended. My context with creation was not the shameful, villainous legacy I had envisioned. Instead, our context was that of witness bearers and co-conspirators actively seeking and subconsciously longing for one another's healing and wholeness. I can embrace and be embraced here. This context makes room for my childhood desire to learn and befriend the earth holding me. Here, my wonder and curiosity serve to honor the pain and joy that built the backdrop of my story. As the earth I behold teaches me about itself, I also come to learn who I am. Thank you for listening. Amber, thank you. Um, and so for our participants, um, we'll be sharing aloud. Um, but for everyone else, I invite you to to maybe if, if you feel so moved to put your responses in the chat. Um, so the I from the live method, immerse yourself in your feelings. Like share the full range of emotions that you felt as, as you listened to this. Um, surface feelings that showed up in your body, maybe like tense shoulders, change of breathing, tears. Um, and then as, as we share aloud, like are there other stories that kind of quickly came to your mind? Um, Something that can be helpful for folks. I know that this was helpful for my high school students. Um, Timmy's brought this to us. Um, a wheel to help you name your emotions, right? Like I felt this, my where, right? Like very specifically, like not just what I felt, but where in my body, like grounding ourselves in an embodied way in this. And so I'm going to invite uh, our participants to, to share and I invite everyone else to put stuff in the chat if you feel so called. I'll say that I I felt a little bit sad for that little girl who once was, you know, like really getting into the dirt and loved to to play, and then and then you have your your well intentioned mother who wanted to care for you, and and like she had the best intentions and we love our we love our parents we love our family and you want to you wanted to follow follow what she said um but then like you said you never really identified with that little girl as as you 
were told the story growing up. So I, I felt sadness in my chest a little bit for that, that disconnection there. Yeah, piggybacking off of that, I felt a lot of sadness as I thought about the dirt being bad and your mother teaching that to you. I, I had this curiosity that came out of my heart, like what stories and what things did your family inherit that made that true, right? Because those don't come out of nowhere, right? Like being taught that dirt is bad, that's not that came out of trauma, right? And so I feel sadness. Um, when I first heard your story, I have felt sadness for you, but now I feel sadness for your family um, and your ancestors. And um, it brought up this story for me. When I was really young, my mother couldn't find me playing outside. And I was just in a, in a tree and she screamed like with this visceral response that and couldn't find me and what I realized that was a trauma response from her and what nature indicated for her so yeah so that it brought that up so I'm really sad but I'm happy to hear your story friend I'll jump off of Robert there I felt kind of in my stomach uh, region like devastation when I realized that we weren't actually enemies. It was like I was immersed in your story and the moment when it was like, well, I separated you because of these things and going, ah, oh, me and the land, or, you know, I'm in your story thinking me and the land aren't enemies and the the dissonance and the kind of the awakening that can be discombobulating that I've been um, distanced from this thing that was never an enemy for me. Um, was turned into an enemy for me. For me, there was the like the, the the word when you were called a prissy princess. Like that to me was what like it, as as a gay man that can be a, a thing that can be a struggle, right? Like in in in, in the net that. Um, and so I and, then, and as you continued to share about um, the land and the blood and your ancestors and indigenous points of view. Um, I was feeling kind of overwhelmed by the entrenchment of like the like white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, right? Like how all of these systems of oppression are intertwined. And I was feeling that kind of right up here in my chest. And so... I could of course relate to the spot on the dress and not wanting to be um, seen as, I guess, imperfect as it were. I could, and I didn't play with mud. Hmm. I didn't do that at all. So going back to I hate outside, I, I thought the story was eloquently articulated and quite beautiful, but if I could see a spot on a dress, I would have had the blood curdling scream as well. That was where I resonated with. So she began her stories as as uh, Amber shared her story of, of feeling or emotion that I had was uh, peace. I was glad that she was okay because I thought that something really bad had happened to her. So to know that it was just about a spot on the dress just kind of calm me because I really thought she was going to tell us that something really bad happened to her. So again, I felt the sense of peace that it was just a spot on the dress. Thank you all. V, view it wider. Let the story speak to the stories that you know by heart. What does scripture, your faith tradition, or another faith tradition, how does that show up in this story? Uh, how might the story unearth a new interpretation or invert a familiar passage for you? Whose voice is missing from this story or from our conversation around it? Um, where do power, inequity, systemic evil maybe show up in the story? So V, view it wider. I'm still thinking about the ancestors, so I'll just say that 
I think their voice is missing, right? Like, you know, in order to really think about you, Amber, and moving forward in care of the earth, I feel, I feel at a loss in wanting to know your ancestors' stories and the story maps that they pass down from person to person. Because by the time it gets to this interaction between the two of you, it's not just between the two of you, right? It's the culmination of stories and experiences. And um, yeah, that voice is missing in such a powerful way um, that I, I want to go sit with your old people. So that's me. I keep coming back to uh, thoughts about hugging trees. <laughs> and um, I think really in our in my group too thinking about I, I viscerally feel a call to reconcile with dirt and I'm actually very terrified of that experience and it's and it's odd to me it feels like similar feelings to like when you get married or like you're about to have you go into labor or um it, it's that level of almost like trepidation but like portal like after I do this thing life will not be the same. And I have been warring with uh, putting my actual body on actual earth um, since we started the storytelling process. And I'm, uh, I'm just feeling called again by the story. But I think, I think the thing I'm also feeling, I think, is what came out when I first heard this story was this, the edges being uh, the flesh kind of coming back together and the edges being brought back together uh, in your story. Um, and I think that this, you know, time for me and sitting with it for this amount of time is like, that's what my body and the earth are trying to do. And I'm kind of resisting the <laughs> coming back together at the seams that you spoke of in your story. Um, so it's just, it's just powerful. And it's like changing my life, just hearing your your story and moving me forward spiritually. I thought it was powerful to even even just hear like the the timeline of your discovery and how you started as a child one way and then you were told something by your mother, which made you start to think a different way. And then you had conversations with friends and had your own discovery. And now here you are at this point in your life. And, and it's taken that amount of time and it's taken that timeline to, to discover and, and dig um, like into yourself and, and where, where those things come from. And I thought that was powerful because I think sometimes when we have those like conflicting feelings, we just want to get them over with. Like it's uncomfortable and we just like want to get them over with. But I think there's something that's so like strong and transformational about being able to, to sit with that timeline and, and be able to say like, yes, this is a long process and that's okay but I'm discovering and I'm better now because of this timeline and I didn't rush myself. And I think that's really special. And it just makes the story even more powerful. Robert, I'm thinking about what you said, um, like your reaction earlier about, um, oh my gosh things and stuff. My ADHD has kicked in and it's, it's, it's gone. Um, I talked to a lot about the ancestors and wanting to hear the stories of the ancestors and why, and think, and just wondering what stories that uh, Amber's like family inherited that made them, you know, this, you know, that made them pass down this particular message. Yeah, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. The, I like. And I didn't have the word inherited before. I like that. Thank you. Thinking about um, the, the shame, the shame that came um, from that. Like, like the 
and how that is taught and how that is passed down and how that is inherited um and thinking about again like the, the systemic stuff like what what led to that not just the individual moment of this but like what larger systems are in place that reinforce this that like I'm thinking of my I'm thinking of my godson um when my nephew when he was eating this like big ice chocolate ice cream cone it was like running down his face and last time he visited Boston he was giggling he was just so happy um and like oh no but like oh we we're, we're gonna go to this uh like Red Sox game and, and like oh but you're all dirty oh my gosh but like he's a kid it'll be fine right so where is kind of like Robert talk about that trauma like where is that in me what formed this in me and how can I be a part of the disruption of passing that on so I don't pass it on to him and when I think about like the earth environment etc right I think about like the virtues the values that like what am I accidentally passing on that can be disruptive versus what do I choose to pass on and where do I have control and where do I have to just give it up I have a, a slightly different story, uh, and that is of, in the 1950s, the problem of playing in soil. Uh, my brother uh, got a, an infection, uh, a native spear in his foot in Papua New Guinea, and uh, was very ill. And so the, the mother care, or the fear of not the soil, it's what lies in the soil. The soil has bacteria. And it, it made me also then think of in Australia, they had to close a number of playgrounds and clear the soil because uh, soil had been dumped uh, that had asbestos in it. Uh, and and the, uh, the, the problems of when it's not just soil, it's not just the earth, but rather the other bacteria the other things that might be there uh, that these protective parents want us uh, to be cared for. I know I wrote it, but I'd love to chime in. Um, Cause I don't, I don't know um, how normal this experience is, but in writing the narrative, by the time I got to the end, it was less about trying to communicate something to someone and more about bearing witness to what was bubbling up out of my heart. It was like my fingers were bearing witness to what was in my heart. And um, I noticed that this time around, I almost lost it when I talked about finding the edges and finding that they were flush against each other because um, I thought about quilt makers and how skilled you have to be to be able to make a quilt because you're going to have all sorts of different types of um, fabric that are different sizes. So you have to have a ton of discernment to be able to know like what size, what goes next to what, like what sort of what um, materials to use to even attach them to each other. Um, and so just that deep sense of relief like I felt like almost like a pressure off of my chest deep sense of relief and finding that edge because it means finally like that question of is there a space for me is there room for me somewhere out here was answered with a resounding yes and all of a sudden I and I could see where it was and then I just I think about that like when we begin to see is when we finally have room to start to care for one another. Like if I can see you and you can see me, that is the beginning of us being able to discern like where one another ends and where our needs are. And like even where the beauty lies in one another, even being able to bear witness to that. Um, I was thinking about that. It just, but it starts with knowing where you belong so that you can connect. And 
we have some more information in the chat. I'll read it. Thank you, Amber, for the theme of the earth wanting to receive ancestors back to them. Your story encourages me to reflect on death, transition, the return to earth differently. I have never thought about the earth wanting me or others whom I love to return to the earth, homes from which we came. The thoughts about being apprehensive about dirt are ones that I've had for a long time, especially mud during the season of break up when the snow melts and the ground is muddy before hardening again when summer arrives. Feeling a call to reconcile with dirt is when I continue to move towards slowly, but I am enjoying it through engaging with flowers. Thank you all for this gift. Thanks, Cheryl. I'll share this because it's resonating right now, especially with uh, what Cheryl just said. So I keep thinking of, uh, a novel by Toni Morrison, Beloved, and in, um, I think it's chapter nine. I don't know why I said I think, I know it's chapter nine. Uh, there is a clearing scene where um, one of the main characters, Baby Sucks Holy, uh, invites Black men, women, and children into this clearing that is set apart from the world, and she allows them to experience their full range of emotions, whether it's dancing, whether it's crying, whether, you know, lament, all of these things. And she informs them about self-care in the midst of this wooded uh, place, right? In this wooded sanctuary. She invites them to do whatever is in their heart. And then she says to them, in this here place, we're flesh. And she invites them to come away from the evils of the world to come into this wooded um, pavilion, if you will. So, I think there, there is much to be afraid of out in this world and out in nature, but I can't help thinking about what Baby Suggs wholly invites people into, um, into that beauty of creating, right? I have to, I just love thinking about that because I, I think of Hush Harbor and I was thinking about the the last step so I don't know if we could just go there Nick because I'm kind of wanting to think about something from my tradition <clears throat> all right um and I'll hand it back to Tamisa in just a moment <laughs> uh <laughs> explore the uh, like the aha moments um what surfaced for you that you might want to keep pondering? Like what, what idea had heat or energy for you, not just in the story, in, in the reflections themselves? Uh, what might you want to say out loud so we can help each other hold on to it? Is there a, a faithful step that's emerging? How, how do we enact? What can we put into action? Again, maybe in our own kind of personal lives, but then also in, in climate activism overall, where like, where is, is there, is there hope in this? So I was thinking about my uh, tradition and then Amber, when you were mentioning quilts and thinking about hush harbors and, and ancestors and um, how so much of our story is hidden um, and told through song and movement or creativity and how we hide so much in that. And I couldn't figure out what that had to do with putting my hands in dirt, but I'm starting to realize that like, you know, um, I think generally, generationally being stitched with our ancestors by coming back to land, because the, I feel so deeply that the more I am like kind of going on this journey, like taking advantage of the resources I have because of what my ancestors have done and, and using those resources to heal internally. And that journey is leading me back to the earth. It's leading me to reconcile with the earth and thinking that like there, there's so much of that idea of Sankofa and um, me being freed up to go reconcile um, my body to this land that my ancestors have a very complicated relationship with. Um, and, and going like, it's because of your toil that I, I can actually go back to this soil and put my hands in it and um, reconcile to it because we were never meant to be enemies. And it just sees, it seems like this very beautiful stitching um, that 
uh, makes sense for me that started like in the, these hush harbors where we kept little pots or we hid things in certain ways or we had little stitchings that we did or we would hide stuff in the blankets. I mean, just uh, feeling, you know, in 2024, so connected back to something like a clearing uh, right now in my body and in my in my frame of mind as well. So thank you. I think about this whole um, just like idea that we've kind of been talking about these past few weeks when we've been doing these story sharings of like we're we come from the earth and we're one with the earth like we're not separate from them um, like just like trees we're also created by nature to be here on this earth um, and and yeah we're just we're one and I think that's really powerful and and special um and complicated the quilt is the image and it's really sticking in my mind um especially connecting the story of of of, of losing the stories of ancestors um in the like LGBT world thinking of um, like the the generation that survived like the AIDS crisis is like is aging and slowly starting to die and so like those are because of like forced closeting and in, in, in religious spaces and in cultural spaces um, we're losing so many of those stories and so that made me think of of the AIDS quilt and what does it mean to again kind of like to tie to tie a lot of these things together like what where are all of these like systemic oppressions? How are they connected? And wh where is the, where is the boundary between them blurred? And what does that mean for our advocacy and our solidarity work in that? Right, that like like gay HIV advocacy is 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 not totally separate from like capital B black um, like ancestor story sharing. I'm not meaning to put that on folks. Um, I'm hoping to see a connection in myself yes um yeah and so like seeing how there is a real a real connection in those spaces for advocacy work and what what does that mean for um especially an election year right like what does that mean for for solidarity Yeah, I'm also just moving from the story. I am very, like I'm motivated to want to, okay, so this is naive in some ways, but I'm motivated to want to pass down um, messages of care and messages of, of you know, care ethic to the next generation. So, um, not just in nature, but just in community-wide caring for one another. So that's how I'm hearing it. I'm still planning to hug a tree. That's my commitment. I'm gonna get there. <laughs> You have a professor who, um, LGBT uh, Catholic spirituality professor at, at BC, who I haven't seen in a little while. And he came to share some of his stories about accompanying the first um, Boston College students who were diagnosed with HIV AIDS. Um, and I haven't talked to him in a while. And so I think it'd be good for me to, to reach out. Nick, you're muted. Rookie mistake. Sorry, friends. Um, thank you all. Um, how beautiful. Uh, the sessions uh, that we had had, 
Um, enough this, we're usually a little bit longer. We were on uh, the call for about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, we had a few more folks who kind of in and out, um, a few who weren't able to make it today. Um, yeah, beautiful. I'm really oh, I'm like deeply moved. Um, so I have, we want to spend the rest of our time um, in these two questions, and we don't need to do it in any kind of particular order. Like anyone can come in at any time. Um, and I will, after I finish sharing this, I will put these questions in the chat. Um, so for our, our participants, so the folks that are part of this community um, for the last few weeks, what insights have you gained from, from this experience of the live method and of, of community building? Are there personal, spiritual, communal, environmental things that you've learned? Um, and set, session observers, whether you, you, you dove in with part of your own sharing here or you just kind of sat back and, and observed, um, what insights does this model offer um, for youth and young adult leadership, especially uh, in the spirituality of climate justice? Like where and how can you maybe engage this model in your own work? So I will put these in the chat. I kind of have two thoughts as a session participant. One, it's just been really cool to think like how, how fast we were able to create community, even just by the end of our very first session, but to then think about how much community we've been able to cultivate like over Zoom over the past three or four weeks is just really cool. Um, with being able to, to use this model and really dive into our stories and, and talk to each other. Um, this group of people was just like really amazing to work with. Um, and then my second thing is I think there was something divine about um, just like the timing of all of this. And I think a lot of a lot of us over these past few weeks it seems like other people's stories resonated for different things that are happening in our lives like as session participants um and so i think that was just like divine that's like the only the the only word that's coming to my mind is just like how how divine is it that we have this need like a spiritual emotional need and, and then we just happen to be called to this space where we're hearing stories that are resonating with us and helping to heal these little like fractured parts that, that we're working through in our lives. So much of it for me, was thinking about, um, you know, our own deep wells and their vision for young people, which is a real passion of mine and how to help them tap into soulful practices that mitigate depression and anxiety. And so coming into this space and going a lot of times, there is so much assumption and presumption that is brought to the table when people deal with young people. But the way that this has been crafted is it, it, it really does give them so much agency and it, it invites them in slowly. Um, and I think that that's something that I really love about this model. And uh, personally, it's been really impactful for me. But I think when I think about it kind of making its way, uh, particularly to, to Black students and giving them opportunities to tell their stories in a safe space and to, to hold and make space for each other in this really kind of cool way um, that's not threatening and not paternalistic. Uh, feels really, really um, uh, beautiful and, and really decolonized, which I'm excited about. Yeah, I think for me, uh, I echo the thoughts on Black students because I'm a Black student. So, but I think also this type of model is helpful in terms of different types of disabilities, right? So I'm a Black, um, disabled student, uh, and one of my disabilities is autism, and what can be hard in traditional storytelling um, models is the inability to pause for a few minutes, um, which makes me very anxious, typically. So this type of model, um, even to, I think Alyssa said this earlier, allows, like, it does allow community to form, but what I like about it is I get to have more of a say in how the community is formed versus how traditional storytelling models 
don't really offer me that um, at all. So I'll show that. Um, from a lot of the sessions uh, we've been talking about, like we have these great ideas now. How do we kind of pass this on? How do we engage um, like actual kids, actual youth? Like I was just in the Catholic session uh, before this, and we were discussing like synodality, this new movement in the Catholic Church. How are we church in a way that is like kind of like grassroots, like Amber said, like bottom up? Um, and we're like, well, how do we actually teach this in a classroom? Um, and that was a topic of our conversation. And, and to me, like this is a really incredible way to like really train um, young folks to, if, if nothing else, just to learn how to reflect and to connect and to practicing, like what would engaging this in my actual life look like in ways that, that show them they're not separate from the environment. They're not separate from the sacred, but like the, the sacred is moving in and through their lives as well in a way that gives like the ownership and agency, I think in their own faith traditions. That was um one of the things too you talked that um connectedness that was really poignant for me. Um just going through this process was seeing how we were like inherently connected to one another, how um with each of our stories, each of us was able to like find a connection. Like there was like there wasn't a single story where anyone was like just there's there's nothing I can relate to there like and just like the fact that that like testifies to that commonality of our humanity um and I also think about just just having ha having had the experience as a black woman navigating society a lot of times um that experience of having my voice snuffed out or having um people assert different um attributes to my voice that isn't there like if i emote in any sort of way like i'm an angry black woman <laughs> like as though like i can't just instead of oh this is a human being who if you cut her she bleeds and tears fall um sort of thing and so for me what was really um poignant with this model is that weight was given to the words that I said and the way that I said it. Um, and it wasn't forced through anyone else's lens. Instead, there was a call to meet me where I was with a story. And I think um, like it's very important that like it's also the right type of people, right? Because anyone who's like dead set on centering themselves is going to center themselves. But for those who want to enter into the um, invitation inherent in the model to kind of decolonize and decenter themselves in certain ways. There's that invitation to meet people where they are. And as someone sharing and like witnessing other people give weight to my words actually was very validating and also like gave that sense of relief where I was able to then remind myself that yes, there is inherent weight to my words, even in the midst of having had this experience of being dismissed, like the Imago day that exists in me doesn't disappear because of other people's um, disregard for it. And so it reminded me of the weight of my own words and the weight of my own story um, and how that could reach out and connect to people in ways that only I could. And so being able to do that to like allow ourselves to see each other and be seen, I think there's a lot of potential to do that um, with this model. If you have the right people, the right timing and people who are willing to make sure like everyone stays like on that course. So I'm just, I know, I know I'm like, <laughs> I really appreciated that Dory. I was like, okay, I'm like, thank you for letting me be involved in this. And thank you all. Um, I want to be very cognizant of time. Um, Barbara, I know we have just five minutes. Um, I want to, my hope is to like offer thanks and a few quick resources and close. Is, is that okay with our uh, remaining time? Yes. All right, thank you, man. Um, I'm gonna put some 
resources right now in the chat. Just kidding. It's too many letters. Okay. Well, I'll put it on the uh on on the on the padlet. That's the word. I'll put it on the padlet. Um, how oh, great. It is just some resources, some texts that um th through our own work, um, we we kind of like have come to that would are, are supportive for this kind of work. Like if you're looking for like practical theological texts, um here we go. Um, like Jennifer Ayers and Heavens. Oh my gosh, I was fangirling Jennifer was on earlier. Oh, it's fabulous. Um, it's like Paulo Freire's work, um, Bell Hooks, uh, Kwok Long, like these kinds of things. And so uh, I'll put that on the Padlet for um, more support in, in you using this model. And especially uh, Dory's website, dorybaker.com is where you can find um, all of like ev everything that we've used. Um, again, her, her updated and expanded book. Um, thank you so much to Dory for allowing us to use this and to like sh shepherding us through this experience. Um, you have my contact info and you have Tamisa's contact info um, right there. Again, we are incredibly grateful to all of you. And I want to, now as I, as you all take screenshots and just put my Instagram and uh, and Tamisa's website in, in your phones, um, you know, <laughs> Well, no, we'll, we'll head back here. And I just want to like really, really, I'm so incredibly grateful to Tamise um, for your partnership in this. Um, Amber, for your story today. Robert, Alyssa, for your participation and, and your vulnerability and your hearts, just this entire experience. Um, I was like, oh, this this could be fun. A new way to get involved in the REA. If nothing else, it'll look great in a resume, right? But like in this experience, in this community, like it's been really, really powerful and beautiful. So I'm just really grateful. All right, friends, we are going to um, uh, blow out our candle and call it a day. Thank you.